When Napoleon met with the great French scientist Pierre Simon Laplace, he congratulated him on all of his extraordinary accomplishments in physics and mathematics and astronomy, or as it was called at the time, celestial mechanics. But he lamented the fact that out of all of Laplace's works unraveling the mysteries of the universe, he had never once mentioned the universe's designer. To which Laplace replied, I had no need for that hypothesis. The origin of life is something that on the surface can seem pretty perplexing. But when we study chemical evolution, we see that these complex organic molecules, things like amino acids and fatty acids, for example, self-assemble from very, very simple pieces under relatively quite mundane conditions, and that they gain new and exciting functions as they increase in complexity through totally natural processes, and that they behave the exact same way that they would inside of a living organism, just by obeying the most basic laws of physics and chemistry. And as far as the synergy of life, as you put it, when we look at things like coevolution and ecology, we see that the coordination of the evolutionary trajectories of different species and their continued reliance on all of the abiotic factors around them is something that's not only predictable, but inevitable. Life simply doesn't work any other way. Now, it could be argued that all of this just seems too perfect, that these molecules had to be in the right place at the right time, on the right kind of planet, orbiting the right kind of star at just the right distance, and that evolution had to happen at just the right way, at just the right momentum to make an animal like us evolve at just the right time, but all of this is putting the cart before the horse. We evolved on this planet because of the conditions on this planet. If the conditions had been different, we would have evolved differently, or life might never have gotten started at all. And besides, when you talk about this planet as something that's special because it contains life, we're forgetting about the fact that there are billions and billions of other galaxies out there, each with hundreds of billions of their own stars, with countless trillions of planets between them. If 1% of 1% of 1% of what's out there could potentially harbor life, we will be talking about a number of habitable worlds so large that you could understandably confuse it with infinity. And when you compare that massive number with the unending and vast nothingness all around it, life begins to seem a lot less like a miracle and a lot more like an inevitability. The point is, this universe is not perfect for us. We are just an emergent property of it. And as far as this claim that life seems so improbable that it must have a designer, the truth is, we simply have no need for that hypothesis. What were electric eels called before we found electricity? Electric eels come from the Amazon rainforest. So what they were called before we knew about electricity is whatever the indigenous peoples of that area wanted to call them. There are over 300 indigenous languages from that region. The one that I learned in school is Arimna, which I believe comes from Venezuela, and it roughly translates to a thing that paralyzes you, or something that takes away your ability to move. Then English naturalists rediscovered them and started calling them numb eels, because they'll make you go numb. And then there was this long stretch of time when all biologists were trying to refer to everything by its scientific name, which in this case is Electrophorus electricus, I think because, you know, Linnaeus is super freaking imaginative and clever. And then Michael Faraday started doing experiments on them in the 1800s and discovering their electrical potential again, and then we started calling them electric eels. But quite frankly, I think we could have saved a lot of time if we would have just asked one what its name is. This comment was left on my video where I talked about LGBT people being represented in the media and why I think that the amount of pushback that they get is pretty absurd. And this person decided to do all the hard work and just prove my point for me by saying that I must not be watching enough TV, or I just want all gay TV, because you just can't find any straight white men on commercials or whatever anymore. And first of all, can we all take a second to appreciate just how awesome all gay TV would be? Like, I know that LGBT people are not a monolith, so it wouldn't just be the same thing all the time. But Trixie and Katya are my favorite. And if you had a whole channel just for them, I'd let that shit run 24-7. That would be great. But anyway, let's pretend for a second like this person is as oppressed as they think they are. Let's pretend like you actually can't find any cis straight white men on commercials or maybe on the news or in movies or on on TV shows, or in books, or magazines. There's just no representation of straight white men whatsoever. Why would that be a problem? Why would that bother you? 
Why might it stunt your development? Why might it hurt you as a child? Why might it affect your whole life and your whole version of reality to never see anybody like you represented anywhere in the world? Why might that be an issue for you? And when you can wrap your head around that, you might start to understand just a little bit of how LGBT people and people of color have felt for freaking centuries. Because here's a surprise. They've been here the whole time. They're not a new thing. And yet, up till about this point, maybe the last 50 years or so, maybe, they just haven't been shown on anything in any kind of a good light. It's been all cis straight white men, maybe sometimes a straight white woman too. Gosh, how daring. And then every now and then, a little sprinkling of spice, they throw in a brown person or a gay person, usually as comic relief. Can you understand how that's a crap situation? Do you see how you didn't notice it when it was just for you, and now that it's not just for you, it's a problem? Other people being treated like you does not mean that you are being treated worse. Other people getting attention does not mean that you're being ignored. The best argument you could make here is to say that it's overrepresentation. That the amount of gay people in media isn't representative of the actual population. Well, guess what? The amount of superheroes in the media isn't representative of the population either. But that's what capitalism's all about. We pay the TV companies to make content that we want to watch. And right now, since we're treating gay people like humans for the first time, we want to see them and learn about them and explore them and be excited about them and celebrate them. Just watch TV or change the channel, dude. If you travel back in time to see one extinct animal, what would it be? I want to go back and see Homo erectus, which is one of our most recent ancestors. But I don't just want to see the animal itself. In fact, if I never actually see the animal at all, that's totally fine. What I want to see is where they were living and what that environment looked like while they were living there. And how were they living in that environment? That is what I really want to know. Because you see, there are two different groups of hypotheses about why humans evolved the way that we did. First are the habitat-specific hypotheses. These hold that our adaptations are the response to the selection pressures of a specific environment. Basic Darwinian evolution. So, for example, the savanna hypothesis talks about the increasing aridity in Africa during the Pliocene and the early Pleistocene. So, the earth is getting cooler and drier, and in response to this increasing aridity, there are these big new savanna grasslands that are opening up, and so all of the adaptations that are associated with human evolution, behavioral changes like meat eating and tool making, morphological changes like big brains and bipedalism, right? All of these things are associated with this changing environment. But then there's what we call the variability selection hypothesis, which is the idea that our adaptations are geared towards novelty not towards one specific environment. We evolved this way because there were lots of different environments around at this time, and we had to be able to flow in and out of any of them that we needed to. And so today, we see humans are able to settle down pretty much anywhere on Earth, in any climate, in any biome, and be able to eke out an existence because of the amazing adaptations that we have. So the question is, are we just the ultimate generalists? Is this a very new thing, or is this actually part of our evolutionary trajectory? Do we evolve this way so that we could do what we're doing today? And have we been doing it for a long time? And if I could just see what Homo erectus was doing like a million and a half years ago, oh my gosh, it would tell us so much. That's actually what my research is in today. That is what I am currently studying and trying to figure out. And if I could just get just a second, a little taste of what, what was the climate like? What, what kind of plants were there? Not just in one place, but all over the Eastern Hemisphere. All these different Homo erectus populations. How were they living? Was it all the same? Or was it totally different every time? That would save us so much time. Me and so many other scientists could learn so much from just one tiny glimpse at how Homo erectus lived anywhere. On today's episode of Weird Stuff I Found While Cleaning Out My Grandma's Attic. Come sit on Pappy's lap. Yeah. Oh, they made him look so embarrassed. <laughs> he should be. Hey there. 
So a super common question that I get asked probably every single day is what do you do when you're a biologist and you're out in the woods hunting for rare turtles and you get lost and you need to find your way out but the sun's kind of going down and it's getting a little bit dark so you figure at a certain point that you're just not going to get out tonight, you probably need to build a campfire and hunker down for the evening, find your way out in the morning. Problem is, all you have is your medical supplies. Again, this happens to the best of us, okay? It's super duper common. Don't sweat it, no shame. What you're gonna do is reach for some glycerin. This is really important for like treating minor skin irritations or just as a general moisturizer. So you generally will have this around. And then some potassium permanganate. This chemical is really important for treating like weeping pus filled sores and also athlete's foot, so that's pretty cool. If you want, you can use some gauze rolls or pads to build a little tinder pile as well. Or you can just grab, you know, some leaves or whatever and make a little pile of tinder just like this, a little something something that can catch fire pretty easily. And all you're gonna do is just pour on some of your potassium permanganate. Just pour some of that right on there. Make a good little pile of it too if you want to. And then throw on your glycerin just like this. Now don't mix this or anything like that. You don't need to do that. Just pour on a little bit of glycerin. And within just a few seconds, those will start reacting together. Should be pretty exothermic. Should help these leaves ignite. And then if you have some extra sticks or twigs or whatever, you can pour those on top. But this right here, is how you're gonna very quickly and easily make a little campfire and help yourself survive in the wilderness. Again, all you need is your med bag, like we all carry with us at all times when we're hunting for our turtles. So I hope that this will help you the next time you're trapped out in the woods. Uh, I know it's helped me more times than I can count. Have an awesome day, stay safe, and never stop learning.